Welcome, my friends, back to my tutorial on Stellar Frontiers. The uh, topic of this particular installment is creating your defense forces. And some people might ask, well, you know, this is a game of exploration, it's a game of solo play, why would I need a defense force, blah, blah, blah. Why would I need to keep track of them, blah, blah. Well, the game mechanics allow for interactions with what I call op, opposing forces or op force and these can be pirates, bandits, gangs, rival house lords, other players. So just like you're exploring the unknown and you're establishing a new colony and eventually a new stellar empire, you need to defend your turf, protect your interests. and there's a number of ways of doing that. And the beginning ways is the creation of your own defense force. And this comes in several types and serves different kind of roles. In that mindset, we look at some of them as an example. We got the Royal Protector Service. Um, the House Lord Secret Police, Watch, or Holy Garden, Guardians of the Divine Person, whatever you choose to call the Protector Service, are those directly responsible for the protection and safety of the House Lord, his dependents and residences, and where the House goes, goes the Protectors. It's a Royal, Royal, Royal Bodyguard Unit, as, and as such, is maintained that way. It's part of the Executive Ministry, so it lays outside the command and control of the military and outside of the command and control of the, C of the special services or CIA or whatever you choose to call your version of the, the uh, uh, intelligence ministry. They also can be formed and utilized in large scale unit combat or in the individual combat. There's three types of combat at scale in this game. Personal combat, which is one individual on one individual or small groups of, of similar situation. Squad level combat, which is basically the same thing, just stepped up. So each, each sheet would represent five individuals, five to seven individuals appropriately, and you would use them in your combat scenario, maneuvering dozens of small units against each other, if you will. And then there is company level or command level which encompasses much grander, larger scale of combat, more like your tabletop war games of the old days. So, portion of the rules for this game is designed and set up to be role play or ran like a tabletop war game. And if you're not familiar with them, the most commonly well known would be Battletech, as an example. And because it's a science sci fi system, there are some parallels to Battletech for a number of reasons, and there are, the mechanics for combat are fairly straightforward, moderately easy once you get the hang of it. It's a little bit of tricky at the beginning, especially when it it's, goes against your, a person's nature to not fudge things. If you follow the true random roll situation, which the law of probability as it's been pointed out to me, just my version of the law of, of averages will dictate the way the rolls are more or less going to fall. And if you roll on that chart and follow the, the actions and reactions of your opposing forces, you get an actual decent set of combat without needing two people sitting at a table. Although I will always acknowledge it's always better in company. So having two or more people engaging in a tabletop war game is an enjoyable way to spend an afternoon. And if you can get some people who don't necessarily want to play the game, but will play the opposing force for you, you could work out your combat that way. And it could be done over the internet. Just something to consider. The Royal Protector Service, your game allows the beginning, you, your house lord arrives, or house lady arrives with two platoons, of the Royal Protector Service, and you gain an additional platoon 
every time your population increases by 25,000, which is the standard for most most the units. You can also recruit I stand corrected. And this particular one is every 100,000 increase. Okay. Down here, every, every 100,000 increase in regional population service may operate any sort of platoon or lance as the household wishes, although it's highly recommended for the first three or four platoons to be infantry placed. Okay. I'm not going to get into that at the moment even though my inc yeah, inclination is to do so. Move on. We have the Regional Militia Command. These are the, this is your army. And because the Imperium is based itself loosely after the Roman Empire of the ancient antiquity, uh, they, the Imperium chooses to call their military, their army, by the legion termina terminology. So they've designated the house lords and ladies must declare their home home army a militia. And it says here the house begins with one platoon or lance and gains a new one for every 25,000 increase of the regional population. A second way to increase this number is to, is to construct one or more militia training commands and to promote them, recruit them, so on and so forth. But that's much harder than it sounds like, because in the beginning, very difficult to get all the material needed to build this build and then to support it. Just saying. We also, each planet also begins with its planetary home guard, or also termed the volunteer militia, or VRM. These are basically the national guard of a given colony. And, well, once again, you begin with a single platoon and can increase the additional platoon for every 25,000 population of the specific planet, not the regional planet. There's two ways of tracking the population for our game. Planetary population, which is based off the individual colony that you've created, and the regional population, which is the total population that's under the control or direct influence of the house lord, i.e. colonies that you established that you've gained or you've conquered or you've annexed to some degree and maintain control of. That's an important designator because there's a number of possibilities for discovering large, heavily populated, lesser tech colon uh, worlds or former colonies and you need to be able to, to influence control over them in order to, to include them in your regional population for good reason. Then we have, uh, and then in a sidebar, Anytime you remove one of these platoon, these units from the particular planet that they come from, you have to roll a uh, a check on the uh, satisfaction chart using the mercenaries using the mercenary satisfaction chart. The reason for that is obviously the, the population is not going to be overly keen on seeing their home defense force moved off to somebody else's planet. That follows with the Planetary Guard, not to be confused with the Royal Guard. The, uh, it says here, upon the completion of an R, NRC, or the Planetary Guard begins with one platoon and lands to flight and gets an uh, additional unit for every 25,000 population assigned to its jurisdiction. So, the Planetary Guard your, co your capital, for example, at some point can build a mounts to an armory to support a planetary guard command. And then at this point, you're going to be able to recruit local people to fill these units out and equip them accordingly. This is a slightly more advanced version of the home guard, and you do not suffer a penalty for transferring them off world to, to control or to influence or impress your house, house's wishes for political gains. Then we bring us to the Royal Guard. Once a house lord reaches the rank of Baron, he or she may form a Royal Guard unit. You begin with one platoon or less, and then additionally in for every 100,000 regional population. These units should be equipped with the best gear and training your house can acquire and manufacture. 
And then it says, do not confuse the Royal Guard with the Royal Protector Service, although their duties overlap. That's something that at a point early on in a lot of your scenarios, you're going to need every available body you got. And to, especially when you're trying to spread over your uh, distance and a number of, of worlds and influence situations or deal with problems, and you find yourself borrowing this force or that force or this force and or intermixing them on a slightly uh, on the next level of command you know, at the company level because you need additional support. Uh, all of these military units require tech support units of some degree. This is in part drawn by the, from the tech tech the tech pool that you have for your given planets or your region, and by recruiting higher tech technicians as needed or as available. Um, then we have what's called the irregular commands. The irregular commands are often company size or smaller, uh, usually formed and supported by a noble or trusted platinum and provide additional forces for the defense. Okay, so your house lady could choose to have her royal musketeer service as an example, as a lame example. And doing so, it falls out of the framework of all the other commands. So she creates this, and in enhancement, she's creating a, part, a, a, a second private bodyguard or a second uh, team of troubleshooters. And they may be very specialized, they may just be hired goons, but in order to, there's the mechanics for allowing you to promote and create these people. Uh, another common example are scout platoons or scout units. Uh, my initial house has created these. Uh, several of my beta testers created them to quite success. Uh, these are semi-independent military organizations that answer to the house and the house command and supplement the both the intelligence service operations and the militia or the military operations. So they have dual roles and there's a different, slight different method on how they gain ranking as opposed to the standard. All your standard units gain one point in ranking each cycle regardless because they're constantly training or updating their knowledge of the whatever it is they do. Irregular commands and mercenaries do not do this. They basically sit on their butts enjoying their downtime. It's only during active missions do they gain ranking. Where in house units, the traditional house units will gain ranking whether or not they're in action. Uh, they will double down. So when they are in action, they gain two points as opposed to one point. So they increase a little faster. Uh, that which brings us to mercenaries. Mercenaries fall under the opposing forces chart uh, uh, section of the book, or right adjacent to it in its own category of mercenaries. Uh, these are what they sound like. These are soldiers for hire, command units for hire. So and they will crop up as events or as part of. Uh, cargo being transported by by freighters and what have you, and these are what uh, another way of augmenting your defensive forces or your offensive forces. They just come at a, an increased cost, which every military unit you create costs money. The bare minimum, a light infantry platoon, which is 25 people, basic equipment, pistols or rifles, melee weapons. Light body armor, no vehicles, that's light infantry, LIF, will cost you 1.67 credits per cycle to maintain each platoon. So potentially a company of, of these individuals could cost you five or six credits a cycle. And it don't sound like a lot, but like modern militaries today, the modern government budgets today, this accumulates quite rapidly. So if I'm running 10 different units, I'm now at uh, 10 different platoons, and they all are light infantry. Now I'm paying out uh, 16.7 credits per cycle of my budget to maintain them, to pay them, keep the equipment in top-notch operation, and keep the basic supplies flow. Mercenaries use the same formula, except they have a, a modifier based on their, their ranking so the more experienced the unit is, the more expensive they are. Just like the larger they are, may increase that modifier slightly too. So it could, a light infantry 
mercenary unit that's light infantry might cost you as much as two and a half credits to to operate to keep keep employed and there are a set of rules for contracts for gaining these units and if the house fails in its side of things there's modifiers that should be applied so you take negative you know the next time somebody wants to go on to a higher merch and you've been you did not kept up your end of the bargain on the previous group well then it's gonna it's going to be more expensive and harder to gain additional uh, mercs and usually the the more negative your house is the the weaker or the lower the lower grade merc units become are, are available the more experienced the more elaborate ones will not become will not accept the contract uh, then we have secondary forces one of these is a, a colonial const constabulary your, your local police force which could be created in platoon levels and a few other agencies which don't belong in this particular uh, bid so we won't cover them the one that comes to mind right off the bat that's the most common is your intelligence ministry uh, ministry yeah. the ministry uh, employs 007's uh, spies that they also can inform and support uh, commando teams, if you will, or, or uh, specialty support services like a SWAT. Now, I'm not using the term right. There's a term for it. It's just not clicking in my head. So to get to that point, we've got a lot of other stuff to do. And we all, and part of it has got to do with just expanding time. Now, your first colony, this is in the blueprint guide, page 101, talks about everything that came with your house when you established your first colony, and included in the, included with the colony ship are one drop shuttle, armor tech, one small craft scale weapons, 100 ballistic pistols, 50 ballistic rifles, 100 suits of light body armor, 50 suits of personal body armor, 50 auto shotguns, and 150 Tech 1 melee weapons. And it says, for the defense, the House Lord made to form one Home Guard platoon, one militia platoon, two Protector Service platoons, all are tried with officers who are ranked green, the crews of the House's small fleet, blah, blah, blah. So, we already have the makes <coughs> So, what I recommend is creating what I call the house warehouse or the military's warehouse every planet that you build a storage facility on includes space for storage for the house's purpose of this sort of thing now manufacturing materials and natural resources each have their own category and a standard storage facility is rated at 300 tons, 150 for the market, 150 for the for store or for long-term storage, so 300 total. Now, there's that. What what we don't have is an un, basically an unlimited number of additional storage slots for non-sellable items. You're not not likely to put these things on a direct market. Not saying that if your house doesn't want a mass production of light body armor, for example, you couldn't ex add that to the specialty section of your exchange, but it's not likely because the odds are really good that you're never going to get enough of this stuff down the road. You're going to find yourself actually needing to purchase a lot of your gear and equipment. There just isn't enough to go around, especially in the very early days. And this allows us to track what's available in the warehouse. Once we've assigned stuff to equipment to a unit we deduct it from here that goes without saying right so i'm going to start with my royal watch here this is what i choose to call for my house uh my protector service like i said this is the secret service and a bodyguard service and to some degree uh the left hand or right hand of the house as needed and to that fact 
it behooves me whenever possible to give it the best amount of equipment that I can. Now, when we talk about des unit designation, the first basic is a light infantry platoon. There are medium, there are heavy, there are assault platoons, there are combat units with vehicles, then there are specialty units like tank platoons, uh, tank lances. These these become lances as because it, that's just makes them easier to designate them separate. And they have fewer personnel, but they equip with heavier equipment. It's possible to motorize or mechanize uh, a platoon by adding transport vehicles of some sort. Another way of getting of spreading your forces out and giving yourself more flexibility is to create uh, a transport platoon within your company level equipment and in that particular unit you may put your transport vehicles so you have enough transport to entire the rest of the platoon or company can be transported or it can be transported piecemeal being that you can deliver one or two platoons and over a stretch of time to a situation as needed though in some cases a lot of times just the bare bones infantry is all that's necessary when you're talking to the royal watch or your, your protector service these are the people that are going to be around keeping an eye on things protecting your your house lord's back so to speak they also potentially protect the terror the turf the, the immediate royal family's uh, residence the royal palace for example uh the executive ministry office itself the the uh the various places that the house lord or lady decide uh, are their personal place. So, if you were to construct a summer palace someplace, for example, down on a, you know, in a tropical area of a planet or something, you might want to have a, uh, a squad or two of these people there, if you have sufficient numbers to keep an eye on. Other than having to rely on uh, hired mercenary-style security companies. So, the. First thing we do is designate that this is the World Watch. I've made this Alpha Platoon already, so it's type. Uh, it's type is going to be light infantry. There's a whole section in the book on the core book that explains the breakdown of all the all the different acronyms for all the different types of units and why. The standard amount is 25 troops, which if I chose to create this at squad level, and in a future installment of this, we will do that for a different purpose and uh, we'll get to it but uh, each squad is roughly five people so and the, the average platoon has five squads in it we know that the ranking according to to the book because it's initial the starting out is tried that gives them 100 points to start with and that the officer is green and starting out with 200 points Now, when going to look at my units, because I'd already chose to use sedans for my house, that gives me a certain set of mechanics. The average platoon space land speed is 5 p8 kilometers per hour. And I'm sure a lot of people argue, well, the people move faster, move slower, blah, blah, blah. I don't want to hear it. We had to make a base, and this is the base. Uh, the hex, which means translates in combat terms, in the large scale, company scale, it's one hex per round. Uh, the genome is Shadan, which dictates the size of the individual troop, which is small. It gives my BP a body points of 2.0 or 20 points, depending on how you want to define it. There is no damage reduction at this point. I don't have any equipment for that. My base cat or combat attitude or a combat attribute is plus 26. Now, I get there because every unit starts with a plus 10 and then there's the if there's a racial modifier in this case the Shadans actually gain a bonus and then there's a bonus for uh, the fact that the Royal Protector Service is considered fanatical and not all units are fanatical traditionally the the, the Protector Service is always fanatical, and the uh, Royal Guard is fanatical. Other combat units are not, although they can become fanatical by other means, and that's to be covered at a point. Anyway, the total was a plus 10 for being fanatical, a plus 10 for the base, and then a plus 6 because of the rate law uh, advantage, so a plus 26. I know that my cost is 1.67, roughly 
threads per cycle. And at this point, I don't have the armor. Now I'm going to give the sub chief or the lieutenant who in command of this platoon a name. Now there's people that sometimes ask, why, why bother? Why name key figures? They're not really NPCs, they're not really player characters, etc, etc, etc. And my argument is that here's the thing. At some point, assuming this unit doesn't get wiped out, my command is going to grow. And when I reach a total of six platoons, six of these sheets, so then form a company. At that point, I might need somebody to be the commander or the captain of my company as a additional command structure element. And by adding names and personality types to these individuals, I can then promote them. And I would say, promote this particular character, or non-player character, to the chief of the protector service, or to the command, the first company of protectors, what have you. I would then pull a random flu from the, the, the unit and promote them to this this particular spot and they would pull their base ranking with them so in this case if this this character got this non-player character gets shifted to another position and I pulled a random flu up there and gave them a new name uh, they would be tried well, she's green they would be tried because they're coming from the ranks is a reason for doing it it's just like at some point I'm going to actually break probably the first and second platoon up into, into five squads and each squad will have a squad leader and then four troopers and each one of the squad leaders will be given a name it's just basically the same formula here except there'll be five five of them making up the platoon that allows me to put the second squad out as a support uh, unit for a uh, intelligence operation, for example. Another method of gaining them skills and, 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 and ranking and utilizing my um, what meager forces I have to their fullest. That's my personal way of, of doing that. It's not in necessarily in the rules saying you have to do that, but it is there. So, in this case, I've got handful of gear and equipment that I can dole out and I have to be careful because I need to have I've got a limited supply of resources and I have a lot of basic units to apply them to including my, my spies and my initial spies and uh, specialists that I'm going to add to some of my other ministries uh, in the near, near future probably in another installment hello I know you like to come up here but there's just not enough room for you and this stuff so, I have to be cautious. In this case, because their primary purpose is to lay defense of close quarter people, I'm going to give them a melee weapon. Now, it's a ubiquitous oh, term, melee weapon. This basically covers the gamut of all melee type style weapons. So it's personal. If you want to give your, your your bodyguards or your royal guard uh, a spear for a melee weapon, by all means do so, because it might look ceremonial, it might look snazzy, uh, you know, it also serves a purpose. It's a defensive weapon and pliable. It's also going to be Tech 1, and I started out with 150, and then I deduct on my fleet list 25, so now I would have 125. And then I'm going to use ballistic pistols, which is also tech one, and deduct it from there. And since I have the the armor, I'm going to give them some personal body armor. I think this way I think I'm, yeah, it's personal body armor. Which is tech one, which gave me an armor of two. Bring in the proper guide. Looking up 
Personal scale melee weapons. We're looking for tech, tech one. Combat knives, swords, etc. Range is range is point blank. Attack modifier is plus eight. To deliver one point one point or one point oh, I think I'm gonna want to look at it. Accuracy or fire. Let's see ammo. They come with a zero ammo. Well in this case we would just say not applicable. One thing about some of the light weapons, and I guess that's something to take into consideration. If you give them if you give your unit a ranged weapon such as a, a crossbow or a bow or a throwing knife, then at that point it's actually it's actually considered uh, having ammo and then would be expendable. So if this was meant to be a throwing knife, then I would say a throwing knife, then the ammo would be one, the rate of fire would be one, and then if I throw it, they use it that one time, then they have zero. So rate of fire in this case is not applicable. Ammo remaining not applicable. Accuracy of fire also not applicable. Uh, our two hit ratio is then going to be the base the base cat is 26 an additional eight so 34 34 percent chance or less of hitting a, hitting whatever it is they hit minus the defense or the damage or the yeah the defense of the other guy so there you have it and pretty much all there was to creating this particular unit. Now I'm going to take my ballistic pistol, I guess, when we get that on here too. We've got personal melee weapons and we got uh, range, personal ranged weapons. So there, I've tried to cover pretty much every category of weapon. I don't have a whole bunch of different types of the same kind. Uh, you see that in a lot of uh, arms and equipment guides where you'll have a, a bunch of different kinds of pistols showing different versions of basically the same weapon. I don't. I chose not to go that route. I chose to just give you the stats and mechanics for the individual category that that pistol falls under and if you as the player or the house, house creator decide to uh, give yourself some kind of unique appearance to something the stats still apply to it. So if you're your you have a description for your standard of pistol that you manufacture or your standard of bodyguard weapon that you manufacture so be it but the mechanics are still the same uh, on a sidebar note there are in the R&D section uh, rules for creating specialty weapons and or combining certain kinds of weapons uh, I had a, a friend who beta tested for years still playing it as a matter of fact uh, he wanted his uh, his protectors to have a kind of a combination of stun weapon and a staff weapon and he wanted it to be geared for a four-armed individual and to get there I made him research the weapon put time and effort into creating it give it an exotic material to de define why it had stun capability and then needed to he had to, to create a specialty a small special uh, factory to produce them and at this point he then had a specialty weapon that was unique to his particular house and or the species that he had created the genome that he created and it, it was something that he produced in limited numbers they were expensive and if somehow they got out on the open market it was because somebody was pulpering from his uh, from his warehouse or from his factory but it added to his enjoyment, I was all for it. So, ballistic pistol, in this case, attack one, short range. The ammo, the rate of fire is one per round, and it has 18, 18 rounds. Ammo remaining would be 18, which we haven't used any of it. 18 goes there. So it confuses. Yeah. Every time I set out to recreate these things, they get slightly different from the original. So originally it would have been one slash eighteen, but we got 
one round at 18 total. The base to hit is a plus 8 because it's tech 1. Damage is also, in this case it's 2.0. It is possible for a single shot from a woodstick pistol to kill somebody, which is the way it should be. And then the accuracy of fire. This is a set of mechanics that you have to go and check based off of the weapon. We'll leave it blank at the moment. But the two hit ratio is the same way. The base is 26 plus 8 is plus 34 or less. There you have it. Pretty much in a nutshell. Now, that was my Royal Watch Platoon. And since I had two of them, I would create two of them. And this is where we'd have two different sheets. Or you could, you know, choose the them back to back, however you want to do it. Just going to throw them up here for you. I like the idea of printing them separate and then putting them in a sleeve in a, in a folder. That way I can easily flip back and forth to them. I can slide them out to make adjustments and push them back in. And if I need to reprint an entire sheet, I can do so without having to deal with them messing with doing it front and back and, wait and burning up extra, extra ink. It's just a personal preference. Now, you can see that there's a section on the bottom. This is for the addition of vehicles. Like I said, at the initial outset, you didn't, your, your house Colonial Upper did not have the space to bring vehicles or combat vehicles. And the difference between motorized and mechanized is vast and simple, depending on how you want to make the discussion. If you give your unit pickup trucks manufactured by your as part of your utility vehicle manufacturer, and they each weigh, you know, they're half ton capacity, so each one weighs one ton with a half ton capacity. Uh, they're large enough to carry a squad of individuals. I'd need five of them, so then I would put five here. I'd figure out what the basic nurse there's entries in the the uh, equipment guide for those and what their basic speed and defense is and so on and so forth for all intents and purposes i've now got myself an impromptu motorized vehicle and then this becomes a motorized light infantry unit or an, an mlif and if i want mechanized well that means actually producing an apc an armored personnel vehicle of some kind or a semi-armored vehicle and that takes more material more time more resources but the stats are here. At that point, this becomes a slightly different type of infantry platoon. And the including of uh, the ability to add hard points to vehicles enhances their defensive and offensive capability. Even commercially made civilian vehicles can have a, a weapon mount established on them, even if it's a crude one. And so a pickup, for example, might have a pencil mount in the back allowing it to carry a light machine gun or a rocket launcher or what have you. So now you start to see how you can enhance your military units. Another way, of course, is purchasing manufactured uh, combat vehicles and stuff from uh, merchants and trade, trade ships as they come through or from trade worlds when you can locate one or when you finally locate one and creating a uh, the factories to produce your own and supporting that all the material needs and costs that that entails. There's also taking them in, in battle as spoils. So if you go up against a, uh, a rogue pirate force and or gang force and they have stuff and you, and you don't destroy them or completely destroy them, you can capture them, repair them, assign them to a unit. And that's one of the many ways to enhance these units over time as part of the game plan. So we got this, we got our warehouse. I also created the first platoon, this is a blank sheet, the first platoon of my militia. And the only, for all intents and purposes, the exact same as my watch. The only difference in this case was they got assigned uh, ballistic rifles instead of pistols, which gives them the same hitting power, same amount of damage, same rate of fire. They get a few, little bit extra and a little bit more ammo capacity, but the range is long range. The and then I gave them light body armor. Light body armor gives them an armor class, an armor rating of three, as opposed to the personal body armor. Now, 
distinctive appearance. A light personal body armor could look like a suit that's bulletproof. It could have, you know, a, a bulletproof vest could categorize as PBR. Whereas uh, an actual more robust looking physical armor where you've got uh, a bulkier jacket that's got you know, ceramics or other elements in it that's supposed to be resistant to weapon fire uh, looks more militaristic would be your light body armor. That once again boils down to semantics of the house. Now on an interesting side plot. A lot of times you find these exotic plants, minerals, animals, what have you. And it is part of your exploration rules. And I've said this before. You can then, uh, if you uh, take the time to establish an R&D lab, you can then assign samples of those exotic materials to your R&D lab, which then gets a chance to make the rolls. They, re they spend X amount of time researching to see if they're valuable. And then they might inc inc find something that enhances protection, for example. Might find some fiber in some exotic plant on this new planet you've, you've, you've settled or you're exploring. You can then exploit this material. The R&D lab spends an additional five cycles under, getting you to understand how they can factor this material into the manufacture of something. And it's not it's not a role to see if they're successful. It's just it's an additional amount of time that's required. At that point, you now would set up. Uh, some kind of low-level operation to harvest this particular plant and strip the fibers out. Then the, the fibers are then given a name or an acronym and assigned to the factor that's producing your light body armor and as a material cost. And your light body armor then gains some sort of modifier. Perhaps it gains the damage reduction modifier or additional armor protection for its category or you know a uh, not a, da a damage reduction, but a deflection option. So it reflects certain. You know, it's possible to have a, a fiber that makes light body armor that's 50% more effective against a laser energy versus you know it's still the same body armor when it comes to ballistic and concussion damage, uh, plasma damage. But when it comes from somebody shooting a laser at it, you have a 50% chance of work. You know, deflecting the shot or reflecting it or whatever. It's just something to, and, and that's applicable to weapons too. So I can make more exotic weapons that are more, do more damage or they're lighter or they have a higher hit modifier, what have you. If we choose to go through the extra steps to pursue that.